good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me uh, to meet you, to speak with you, to discuss the burning issues of our times. And many of them are literally quite burning uh, right now and are being bombed and exploded. And uh, as a Ukrainian British, well, more Ukrainian than British political economist, um, a lot of the problems that we see in the news on daily basis, and they're dropping from the front pages by now, sadly, uh, as we can see, and a lot of the problems that Professor Keen has just described are very close to my heart, sometimes quite literally. Um, what I want to talk about in the uh, 15 minutes that were allocated to me is some of the issues of debt, issues of war, uh, but more specifically macroeconomic and economic restructuring, and what kind of lessons from Ukraine on planning sustainable economy can be drawn. Because what we see in Ukraine right now, the problems that uh, the country is riddled with, is the pinnacle of uh, the problems that, uh, that militarized capitalist imperialism is riddled with. So there is a lot of learning that can happen from there. I'm, go I'm not going to be using any slides. I'm going to outline some broad uh, issues, uh, and hopefully we can get to some kind of more nuanced discussion later. So um, we are often reminded uh, by Russia in the news these days that you know Ukraine is a divided country. It wanted to be part of Russia, and USSR falling apart was a big um, injustice, historical injustice in the words of Putin. Well, in 1991, when Ukraine became independent, it became so by a referendum vote where 92.26% of population voted for independence, including the area of Donbass, uh, where uh, those so-called separatist republics are based, where the support for independence was between 80 to 85% depending on the area. Crimea was between 50 and 60, mainly because there were a lot of retired Russians living there. But that's a separate conversation. But when Ukraine became independent, the reason I'm mentioning this is because, you know, to dispel some of the myths. And I'm, I'm very fond of myths that underpin our economic and political systems, and I talk about them in my work. But when Ukraine became independent, not only did its people vote to be independent, but it was also a highly developed, educated, advanced economy with fully deployed infrastructure and public services, with room for improvement, of course, but still. Uh, albeit, of course, it was part of intertwined, uh, very uh, closely intertwined supply chains of USSR, but still it was an advanced economy. So when people like Fukuyama and the EBRD economists and IMF economists came in with their loans since 92 and started talking about how the country needs to develop, it was a bit laughable, to be entirely honest with you. It wasn't a tabula rasa. It was actually an advanced economy that was building spaceships. Uh, one of my uncles actually was uh, working in the space program in, in Moscow, wasn't allowed out of the country till like 20 years after his retirement. Um, but yeah, we have to remember that this whole kind of like blind spot of the so-called post-Soviet space wasn't some sort of savanna with no inhabitants, with no education. There was a lot going on in there, and I know that that story is quite painful in Poland as well, because it was also a very, very developed and important uh, economy. Uh, when transition had to happen. So the disruption of those complex supply chains that Ukraine was part of has led to multiple complex effects. Some of them we see now cal climax in the war um, uh, that we can also discuss later. But transition to market itself through, through a combination of ill-prescribed Ill reforms and the emergence of the regime of neoliberal cryptocracy that I also document in my work has not only destabilized the country and impoverished the masses, uh, but, but it also impoverished the masses and created a vast socioeconomic inequality. But it also led to what I uh, call in my work de-development, including de-socialization of social reproduction functions that the state has taken upon itself through gender equalizing reforms. Uh, and that, uh, that de-development was not an accident. It is so by design in transition to market and in market economies because the funding of public services and the shrinking of state support for its people rather than capital uh, is seen worldwide. It's a neoliberal dogma. Prop up private investment, protect the uh, capital from the angry mob of the impoverished masses and squeeze them for taxes and de-socialize socialize whatever was funded by the state before. We see the results of that before our eyes. 
One of the fundamental reasons for the myth of transition that was sold uh, to uh, Ukraine amongst other post-Soviet states uh, uh, is that uh, like in one of the most responsible people for that is Francis Fukuyama and his disciples, of course, who declared that the history has ended and the market has won, uh, but that myth was uh, and is a lie. Uh, I talk about that in my book about these different myths that support this transition to market. Uh, the book is called Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian the Empire of Capital from Marketization to Armed Conflict. It was published a couple of years ago to give it a look. Um, but one of the things that we need to understand is that uh, the uh, so-called post-Soviet states didn't abandon USSR because they wanted to be capitalist. That's, that's a lie that was, that was sold around by Francis Fukuyama and his mates. Unbridled, but also the, the idea that we need to transition to market, that there is such a place and space as this kind of unbridled, happy, efficient market is a mess. They never existed. What uh, unregulated markets give us um, instead is inequality, poverty, ecocide, mass extinction, and militarized geopolitical competition. Uh, and again, uh, Ukraine is an excellent example of where it all ends. Dispelling the myth that we need to transition to some sort of mythical nebulous market and looking for alternatives of economic and social systems is the primary task of any scholar and practitioner of any economy to my mind. Centering people in nature and not percentages of growth in formulas that are divorced from reality is what we need to be doing. Um, so again, there is a strong need to move away from this transition narrative in policy design, uh, in policy making, and in analysis to a more nuanced understanding of compound effects of reforms in public services, their nature, their variegated geographically and economically, and even effects, sexed and gendered effects in the economies that we study. We have not seen in Ukraine, for example, the lack of public services and infrastructure, but rather its dilapidation, defunding, and sell-off, and thus making of economic development with all effective socioeconomic costs, such as feminization of poverty, anomie, unemployment, sporadic turns to, to subsistence agriculture, brain drain, labor migration, variegated remittances, reliances, extremes of riches for selected few and poverty for the many. Poland has seen a lot of Ukrainians uh, as migrant workers and now as refugees over the years. So I'm sure that you are quite familiar, um, those of you who are from Poland in, in this room, uh, with what I'm talking about. And this kind of uh, displacement and, or shall we say, like this happy mobility, that's, that's European Commission speak, uh, of the labor market is very unhappy for many. Indeed, it disrupts social fabric. Uh, the phenomenon of so-called uh, Polish plumber, as they po kindly refer to in Britain, is also uh, a result of disruptions economically in Poland uh, through the transition years. And now Ukrainians are performing the role of the Polish plumber in Poland. Uh, excuse me, I do not like that term. This is what the British use. So coming back to Ukraine, when uh, Russia invaded the country, from one of the more, well, actually the most promising, according to some reports, economies of the fall, fall, falling apart USSR, Ukraine has become the poorest uh, and one of the most indebted, one of the poorest country in Europe and the most in, uh, one of the most indebted countries with IMF. That's quite some record in 30 years, right? Uh, and by now, of course, uh, the budgetary expenditure on arms and humanitarian needs and medical needs of the wounded have grown exponentially. The scale of GDP contra contraction that was projected by World Bank in April already was 45% for this year. The recent report of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the recent days state that the rate of poverty will go up by 58% just in the coming year. I say that it's very underestimated projection, uh, each of them. Uh, and the cost of one-time economic losses to infrastructure, uh, as estimated by the Prime Minister Schmegal, uh, already at the end of March stood at one trillion US dollars. Of course, the accurate estimations are impossible at this point. The war is still going on, there are occupied territories, there is constantly moving front line. So talking about any precision and any projections is doing your classical economics, and I will not be doing that. So there are, there are a lot of important questions that we need to be asking ourselves, the questions of what to do, the question of, question of time scales of when and how to do it, the immediacy of those actions, uh, questions of planning, ownership, governance, and financing and priorities for how to rebuild the country. 
Um, one of the problems that Ukraine is facing right now, on top of the expanding, uh, ex ex exploding uh, problems associated with war, is the problem of financing its needs. So in the uh, latest report uh, of, uh, of March, IMF stated that Ukraine will need $4.8 billion in external financing just to weather the recession this year. By now, that number, of course, is bigger. Um, and Ukraine, again, has already been uh, one of the most indebted countries in the world when the war started. How it happened is that there was a lot of chaotic borrowing and there was debt explosion in Ukraine, partly as a result of oligarchic state capture and kleptocracy, uh, but also uh, a lot of it was due to the fact that the war in Ukraine is eight years old. We're in the ninth year of the war. And if you look at the dynamic of Ukraine, uh, of Ukraine debt uh, accruants, you see that since 2014, there was an explosion of that. There is almost a five-time fold increase, especially when you denominate the debt in local currency, hryvnia, which has been crashed because of the wonderful advice that was received from IMF uh, on how to uh, restructure Ukrainian debt and uh, make the country viable. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, collapse of currency exchange value, like there was a three time shrinkage in the conditions of high dollarization and euro euroization and import dependency. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm too animated. And import dependency of the economy has led um, to uh, this kind of combined effects. Uh, in, in this year alone, Ukraine has to pay 7.3 billion US dollars in external debt payments, 3.3 .3 of which goes to, multilater to uh, multilateral institutions, and the, the rest goes to private lenders. Um, and in the next six years, Ukraine has to pay half a billion bucks in surcharges to IMF alone. It is absolutely grotesque that a country in a state of war, uh, unprecedented since the second World War scale needs to be prioritizing its debt payments instead of servicing the needs of its population. That kind of debt servicing is only possible if Ukraine is to forfeit the needs of its population and its military. So what needs to happen? I have a few suggestions and I'm going to go through them quick. In this extraordinary uh, situation, Ukraine presents a case for large-scale multifaceted international assistance state debt cancellation or jubilee, whatever your preferred term is, um, as well as household debt write-off um, and, so, and solving of the issue of the lost, uh, lost housing stock investment remuneration. There are a lot of people who paid up mortgages or were halfway through paying a mortgage on a building that's destroyed. The government's response is that they are going to compensate the developers of um, uh, and, and mortgage holders, but not the, act uh, the, the banks for the potential loss of investment, but not people who have paid up uh, for their mortgages. So there is, you know, there is a lot of interest in detail that we need to be talking about. There are some promises that have been made uh, by president, uh, by presidential administration about compensating people for the losses, but if, if, uh, their rec if the government's record is anything to judge by, that will never materialize. So Ukraine's ability to manage its affairs uh, is heavily regulated, is, 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 uh, is regulated by the conditions of engagement and obligations to its Western partners, who are debt givers, and also, tra and also uh, its trade partners. And a lot of it is governed by various instances of international law, multilateral, uh, multilateral and bilateral agreements with world trade organizations, and the deep comprehensive free trade agreement with the EU. And some of that conditionality is very strict demands for privatization, demands on, of uh, fiscal austerity, uh, and so on and so forth. And there need to be a radical revision for that to allow for fiscal activism, meaning uh, measures aimed at stabilizing business cycles and discretionary use of fiscal policy. Ukraine, Ukraine's state needs to become developmental state. This is what needs to happen. Uh, and uh, we've already seen uh, that uh, you know, a lot of debt givers and condition setters, um, the way that they set those conditions for Ukraine and for other states, do not center ecological sustainability and hinder socialist trajectories in the countries. And there is a historic opportunity to do a revision of that. There's been some improvement in terms of, for example, suspension of import quotas and tariffs 
on exports to the EU for Ukraine to kind of help it boost trade, but you cannot trade your way out of the mess that's created there. Something much serious needs to happen. So this, uh, this kind of uh, financial restructuring needs to happen. Next, we need to critique uh, and abandon, and abandon uh, wartime austerity and austerity, generally speaking. Austerity, generally speaking, as an economical and unecological, especially in the, especially if it is done in the name of debt servicing. Uh, instead, of we, instead, we need full state-funded redevelopment and financing of public services and care economy, creation of uh, green jobs, expansion of care economy and jobs uh, and uh, jobs in low carbon sectors from the outset investment in those sectors state investment through borrowing but also after the uh, write off of the uh, of the foreign debt uh, on top of that of course uh, the financing of Ukrainian reconstruction need to be happening through uh, uh, through compensation uh, and sanctions uh, on Russia, but, gener but also through a large-scale macroeconomic assistance program uh, on the on the world uh, level. There are some attempts to do that through IMF and and World Bank, but the way that they are done, uh, it 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 really desires to be. Uh, it, it really desires improvement, and uh, Professor King already described the problems with some of those forms of financing. So what we need, uh, again, is the construction of, uh, of a much more res resilient, I hate that word, but uh, buoyant, shall we say, uh, economy, and that financing needs to, needs to include nationalization of oligarchic assets and deoffshoreization of the world economy. Ukraine cannot on its own achieve what needs to be achieved. There, there are international rules that are being exploited by oligarchs in Ukraine, in Poland, in Britain, and in the United States, uh, but without clamping down on which no uh, just transition, energy, democracy, and green future can happen. Uh, and for that, we need a fundamental rewriting of global debt and policy conditionality regime. We need the removal of those black holes, as I call them in my work, of offshore tax avoidance and evasion, and tra including transfer pricing. Um, we need transparency of what's going on with finance internationally. And we need to develop a, a serious proposal for a potential plan case to follow for reconstruction of similar economies around the world, because it's not just Ukraine, it's a lot of other uh, countries around the world. We need to think beyond Ukraine, but learn from this crisis, learn from this war, and uh, together build alternative economic systems for noospheric societies. We need to put all of, our, all of our scientific capacity to try to survive on this planet that our so-called unbridled market absolutely destroyed. Thank you very much.